welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I'm your host, Kim Nalene, covering for Darren Jaime. We thank you for joining us. If you are asking the question, what is this show all about? We bring you a forum discussion providing a deeper understanding of the issues and inequities many communities face. From systemic inequalities to pressing social problems, our guests will provide multiple perspectives and insights to help us better understand and address these challenges. We invite you to stay connected with us as the Social Justice Forum starts now. Today, the world solemnly commemorates a day etched into the annals of history, a day that forever altered the course of our world. 22 years ago, our nation awoke to an unfathomable tragedy. Four commercial airliners hijacked by terrorists carried out devastating attacks. Two of these three planes struck the iconic World Trade Center towers in New York City, causing unimaginable destruction and an immeasurable loss of life. Another plane targeted the Pentagon, a symbol of our nation's defense, while the fourth plane, which was Flight 93, was heroically brought down by brave passengers in a field in Pennsylvania, averting further catastrophe. Today, on behalf of BronxNet, we pay our deepest respects to the nearly 3,000 innocent souls who lost their lives. Each of these individuals had dreams, families, and unique stories. They were mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, friends, and colleagues. Their lives were tragically cut short, leaving behind a void that can never be filled. As we gather here, let us observe a moment of profound silence, not just to remember the victims, but also to honor their families and all those whose lives were forever changed by the events of that fateful day.
Though two decades have passed, we remain unified in our commitment to remember, honor, and pay our respects. We draw strength from the resilience of the survivors and the families who carry the heavy burden of grief. May we always remember the victims and their families, and may we find strength in unity. We have to take a quick break. We'll be back right after this. We all know what it's like to feel alone, but it just takes one new connection. Want to get out of here? To empower many. This is unbelievable. It doesn't take a superhero to bring forces together. We all have the power to reach out. Let's go! And help someone feel like they belong. Pretty cool, huh? We are stronger together. Done the hard part. You quit smoking. Now do the easy part and get scanned for lung cancer. If you smoked, you may still be at risk, but early detection could save your life. Talk to your doctor and learn more at savedbythescan.org. And I'll be your sub today. Can you see anything different as a pill? No. No. You don't know? Fentanyl is being mixed into everything now. There is only one thing that will save somebody's life. That is naloxone nasal spray. Fentanyl is cheap, it's potent, and it's profitable. Why would drug dealers put a lethal dose of fentanyl in drugs if they know it's so harmful? It's really just all about the money. I just didn't realize that one pill could change your whole life. More kitchen now. Welcome back. Established in 1844 by concerned citizens and officially empowered by the state to conduct oversight of its prisons in 1846, CANY stands as one of the nation's pioneering organizations tasked with administering civilian supervision of correctional facilities. Joining us now is the executive director of Cor Correctional Association of New York, Jennifer Scaife. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. Now, I want to also ask, is it a C-A-N-Y or canny? We, we say canny. Canny? Okay, great. So can you just tell us a little bit more about canny and its mission in your own words? Sure. So the Correctional Association of New York, canny, uh, is an independent organization that has authority under state law to provide oversight of state prisons. And that means that we have access to some of the most, uh, the least transparent um, and most isolated institutions in our society. And we bring groups of up to 12 people into these facilities to meet with administrators of the prison, employees who provide programs, medical care, mental health treatment. And we conduct a lot of interviews with incarcerated people themselves to understand what's going on, what's going well, and where there are areas that need public scrutiny 
uh, greater attention um, and significant improvement. Now, I touched on it briefly uh, as I introduced the segment, but can you, you know, talk a little bit further about the historical context behind Canny's founding and its early role in advocating for prison reform in New York State? Well, Canny was actually founded as the Prison Association of New York. And uh, in 1844 and in the second half of the 19th century, mass incarceration as we know it today did not exist. And there were different kinds of problems. So the members of the organization were concerned about issues such as hard labor and uh, corporal punishment and the lack of opportunities for people coming home following a sentence. Some of these concerns remain uh, our concerns today. The organization, though, going back over the last 175 plus years, has had a role in abolishing the death penalty in New York State, setting up the probation and parole system. And uh, in more contemporary modern times, advocating for legislation that prohibits shackling during childbirth, for example, um, and restricting the use of long-term solitary confinement. So the organization has had a significant role in many of the reforms of the correction system um, as, as we know it today. Now, in 2021, legislation was passed to codify Kenny's authority to visit, access, inspect, and report on state prisons. How has this legislative change enhanced Kenny's ability to fulfill its mission? It was a very important legislative event in our history. While we always had legal authority, well, I should say since 1846, two years after our founding, the law did not specify some of the uh, powers that we now have. And among them are that we provide the state prison agency, the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, 72 hours notice prior to conducting a monitoring visit. Previously, we did not have the authority to uh, provide this short a notice. We had to arrange for a monitoring visit with the department 30 days in advance. Another provision of the new legislation uh, guarantees our ability to carry out confidential conversations with incarcerated people and employees. And that's significant because it's really important to be able to hear uh, without an earshot of a prison administrator, um, what somebody's experience is, whether they're incarcerated at a given facility or whether they work there. Um, and then another provision of the law, among others, uh, guaranteed our ability to send surveys in to incarcerated people to gather information at a large scale about their experiences, their attitudes, and the things that they think could be improved about their, uh, their time in custody. Now, Kenny has been instrumental in advocating for changes in prison policies and practices, including limiting the use of solitary confinement. I want to learn a little bit more about that, but could you just also elaborate on some of the recent initiatives and reform reforms that Kenny has been involved in? So the organization over its history has had kind of a number of different roles. In uh, the early part of the 20th century, it was very involved in providing reentry services, for example. And then under leadership uh, in the latter part of the 20th century, became very involved in legislative campaigns to reform sentencing practices, for example. The Rockefeller drug law reform um, was one of the um, initiatives that Kenny had a key role in advocating um, for. Currently, our role is more focused on conducting the oversight of prison, which is, in the case of HALT, the legislation that you mentioned, 
that involved our going into the facilities and observing the conditions in solitary confinement units in residential rehabilitation units, which is a new kind of unit created by the law. And then understanding by talking to staff, by talking to incarcerated people, and then by examining administrative data from the agency itself, what is happening in terms of the sea change that the Holt Law promised in terms of the way that the prison manages misbehavior and isolation? And what are the gaps between the letter and the spirit of the law and the actual implementation of it? Um, so while our recent monitoring activities has, have not focused on the uh, reforming those practices so much as informing the public about what is going on so that policymakers, advocates, lawyers, family members, and members of the government are uh, able to access information. Um, we, we have played a significant role in our history in the legislative advocacy that has led to these reforms. Now, I think that kind of leads into my next question, basically, uh, where transparency and accountability are core values of CANI. Can you explain how CANI's monitoring and reporting processes contribute to these values with the criminal justice system? Um, thank you for asking that question. Um, we, uh, as you said, transparency and accountability are the core values um, of CANI and of oversight, I'd say more broadly. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, prisons are among the least transparent, least accessible institutions, public institutions in our society. And the people who are incarcerated in them are, are among the most disenfranchised people in our society. Um, and so the fact that we are able to go in and carry out conversations with currently incarcerated people and carry out what they said, we are able to cast our eyes on physical conditions, the environmental conditions, the program areas, the um, clinical spaces where people receive treatment, and then report to the public and policymakers and advocates about what we're seeing uh, represents an extremely rare and precious component of the criminal justice reform ecosystem in New York. Um, and we believe and know that it is only armed with the information about what's going on that various actors that I mentioned are then able help bring about accountability, whether that means providing additional that we know work and that incarceration want better access to, or if it means holding the agency accountable or not fully implementing the law uh, in the case of a new legislative initiative. Now, I really want to talk about uh, Kenny's value, uh, basically where anti-racism comes in. I think that over the past few years, as people started to learn a little bit more just about the criminal justice system, um, it's hard to ignore the racial aspect of it. And I think that it's great that your organization is uh, kind of acknowledging that this is an issue, um, basically saying that they're against racism or, you know, anti-racist. Can you just talk about how your organization addresses racial disparities within the criminal justice system and what steps are taken to promote racial equity in your work? Mm -hmm. So prisons are at the end of a long line of decisions that are made across a number of different disparate points in the criminal justice system, starting with arrest, um, through prosecution, sentencing, um, and then all the way through to parole, release, and reentry. But we also know that the uh, disparities in that system did not start at arrest. They start with disparate access to 
high quality health care and mental health treatment, disparate access to affordable, safe, healthy housing, disparate access to good schools, and so on. And these are uh, systemic structures and policies that have evolved in our country along with our country's legacy of racial oppression and slavery. And so the disparities and racial inequity that we see showing up in prisons in New York State um, echo systems that are at play throughout our society um, and in some cases serve to reinforce those disparities and exacerbate them. Um, so, for example, the New York State Inspector General last fall released a report following a years-long investigation that found that Black people in prison uh, are disproportionately sanctioned for misbehavior and punished uh, when compared to their uh, white counterparts in prison. And so this is another government entity, an investigation that the state of New York has, um, has presented as a challenge that the prison system faces, not just in disparities that they inherit from decisions that are happening earlier in the criminal justice process, but uh, disparities that they are reproducing and reinforcing uh, in their own uh, enforcement of prison rules. Now, so oh, I'm sorry, you can continue. Well, so I just want to say that one of the ways that um, that we address these issues in our monitoring is when we see systematic examples of disparities playing out, as we have recently recently, for example, at Marcy Correctional Facility, where um, many of the people that we interviewed reported that young Black men who wore their hair in a particular style of braids or dreads or cornrows, for example, were being systematically excluded from the mess hall line and effectively prevented from eating a meal. Um, this is a finding that we surfaced in our report that's available on our website, and we cited the Inspector General's uh, preceding investigation that found these disparities in the disciplinary process as a uh, basis for asserting that these disparities likely are existing in other areas of prison operations, and they deserve our attention are serious concern, and they deserve a uh, an appropriate response from the agency. Now, Kenny envisions a future with transformed prison conditions uh, that promote several things, such as health, safety, and justice. I know it's a, a long way. There's a lot of work to be done, but can you just quickly explain, you know, uh, what that vision entails and how you how your organization plans to hopefully work towards that? Mm -hmm. So the role of oversight, as, as we've discussed, is really focused on shedding a light on the kind of darkest corners of the criminal justice system. And um, so our work does not directly bring about changes in the near term to the conditions that we observe. Um, most of the conditions that we observe require a systemic and, in some cases, societal uh, change of heart in terms of improving um, the uh, inadequate and, in some, in some cases, uh, abusive practices that we, that we witness. Um, so, as you said, <laughs> we have a long way to go to create facilities that are, um, I think, in full compliance with human rights and civil rights standards uh, and standards of recovery and, um, and therapeutic change. So um, we think that through continuing to do the monitoring that we're doing, bringing information out to 
policymakers, advocates, activists, and giving people the kind of data and the qualitative kind of anecdotal evidence, the narrative, the personal histories that we hear um, will gradually bring about this, this change that we call for. Um, it is an incremental process, and we work as a component of a much larger uh, movement of advocates and practitioners who have different functions in our system. So while many advocates call for an abolition of the systems that we are currently working within, um, we are focused on what's going on right now in the 44 facilities in New York State, the 30,000 people who are incarcerated in them, and uh, the roughly 26,000 people who work in these facilities across the state, um, and, and think that there is ample opportunity for change and room for improvement in the meantime while our broader society uh, grapples with these much tougher questions about uh, racial equity, about violence, uh, and uh, access to um, the tools that people need in order to lead healthy and uh, productive lives. Well, Jennifer, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about a topic that's honestly very complex. And I think, like, you can have all the time in the world, and there just still be so much to, you know, touch on. So I appreciate you taking the time, you know, just to talk to us a little bit about this. Well, thanks for your interest. And I encourage anyone who wants to learn more to go to our website, which is correctionalassociation.org. We have to take a quick break, but we'll be back right after this. I don't know why you're so sad. You've got a roof over your head. Bro, you gotta stop with that depression stuff. That's a white people thing. Escúchame, en esta casa, los hombres no lloran. You all right? It just feels like it's coming from everywhere. Do you want to talk about it? Thanks for hearing me out, bro. Appreciate it. You can talk to me if you're feeling sad. Whenever you need to talk, I'm here, OK? Most hiring algorithms would scream me out. Some bosses couldn't see me as a leader. I've run this place for 20 years, but I still need to prove that I'm more than what you see on paper. I've been running code as long as I've been able to reach a keyboard. This is what I do. It's second nature for me, coordinating 100 details at once. It's the way my mind works. I have a very mechanical brain. I sold them on my skills. You gotta be so good they can't ignore you. My magic is... Analytics and empathy. That's how I'm getting clients. You have to have the confidence in yourself to show up and defy the odds. I am more than who I am on paper. I never got a college degree. And today, I'm the CEO of my own company. People want to tell me I'm one in a million when actually I'm one of millions. The stars are all around us. It's time for them to shine. Even though we didn't grow up together, he's my favorite brother. Hey, sis. I'm the baby of the family, and he's the gentle giant. What you know about poor Georgia? Man, please, that's a classic. Oh, you know when they say people boys, are a rare breed? Yeah, he's that. That was my favorite memory. He was always for you. This is a true story of me, Bridget Floyd, and this guy, George Perry Floyd Jr., my big brother.
Welcome back. The Transnational Villages Network is a grassroots organization driven by immigrants and powered by immigrants. Their mission is to champion complete inclusion and equitable access to rights for the 500,000 plus indigenous immigrants residing in New York City. Here to tell us more is Transnational Villages Network social worker, Regina Favela. Regina, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, can you just start by telling us a little bit more about the organization and its mission to advance cultural, social, and economic inclusion? Of course. So we are a grassroots network of immigrant leaders and groups of immigrants and um, indigenous folks from their countries of origin living in New York City. New York City is actually home to the largest urban population of, in the United States of folks uh, that identify as First Natives, um, indigenous peoples of the Americas. And so we are really hoping to be a platform for these communities to share in their language, their culture, and really be um, pioneers for the issues that are important to them and finding the solutions for those issues. Um, so as a social worker, my role is in connecting folks to public benefits, um, supporting them in their applications, maintenance, and recertification of the benefits. But we're, of course, also working to connect folks with other resources in the communities that promote their health and well-being um, and really trying to be an advocate for, for these populations. Now, I, I think that it's so important or something that stood out to me is the fact that it's uh, people within the community helping others within that community. Can you just talk about the importance of having somebody who maybe shares your background be the one to help you as opposed to maybe someone who doesn't know your experience, uh, try, mm -hmm. even though they may have good intentions, um, it just may be a little bit... Uh, just of a, a more challenging experience to kind of deal with, especially like if you're living in a place like New York City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the greatest strengths that we have is really the knowledge of the community members that are willing to share that knowledge. A lot of folks have been here, you know, for a long period of time and call New York their home, while some folks are newer to, to the South Bronx specifically, which is where we're located. And I think it's really important that they have found um, ways to navigate the systems in New York, whether that's the hospital systems, the court systems, um, the public benefits and are sharing in that knowledge. And I think it's really critical, especially for a population that maybe doesn't have um, the same digital literacy or language skills. A lot of our folks don't speak um, English and a lot of folks don't speak Spanish either. Their primary language might be an indigenous language from their home country. So really having a community of people that care about you and also know your language and your culture and can share in that experience is really vital. We have a group of interpreters that are providing those language services that are so vital to accessing resources and can share in that knowledge um, and build that strength. And like, as you mentioned, that representation is so important because they understand where the community members are coming from and are able to help them navigate those systems um, in ways that you know outsiders might not know, especially with that cultural component that is so key. Now, one key approach is transnational organizing. Could you explain what this means and how it empowers indigenous immigrant communities to address challenges in New York City? Mm -hmm. So for us, transnational means working with in both the U.S. and the New York City context and um, in the Tristan area, but also working in Mexico, where a lot of our folks are coming from. So we have a lot of partnerships that are working with individuals and agencies that are in Mexico and also in other countries of origin, including Honduras, Guatemala, Ecuador, across the Americas. Um, and that's really vital because the people that are, we're working with in these countries have either lived experience themselves identifying as indigenous or as from these communities, or have expertise and knowledge in working with these communities. So by creating these networks, these transnational avenues of communication, we're really able to harness that, that um, knowledge that exists there and bring that to our communities and also share what we know of the US systems um, across as well. And so that has really helped straighten our programming where we're able to bring in that knowledge either through Zoom calls or um, through our weekly um, meetings that we have, bringing that knowledge here and making sure that we're still staying connected to our culture from our home countries, even though we're living in New York and really strengthening that partnership. Now, I, I want to like touch on that a little bit more uh, because being culturally competent is so important. And I, I think a lot of organizations, although they mean well, sometimes they think like one size fits all for a lot of um, mm -hmm. groups of people who are maybe experiencing a lot of challenges, uh, whether they are from an immigrant background or maybe they're just, um, maybe they're possibly low income. Maybe they just have some, you know, uh, Thing that they're dealing with can you just talk about the importance of being culturally competent and off offering services that kind of highlight that mm -hmm. yeah so something that we say is um 
it's really hard to be competent in another person's culture, right? So we talk about cultural humility and really making sure to honor that person's culture and letting them use their own words and how they express themselves in what they um, think and feel about their culture because every person will experience that culture differently. So really wanting to bring awareness to that point um, and highlight that that experience is unique to each individual. Um, but of course, knowing that culturally um, relevant and appropriate ways of you know, handling mental, mental health or um, physical health care or in how to navigate these systems is really vital so that folks feel comfortable accessing these systems and staying enrolled in systems, uh, in services. So for us, it really means going to our community members and learning from them about their experiences and how to bring that into the work and being sure that we're constantly going to them um, for that information and being sure that we are including them in all decision making. One of the things that that it does really well is think about um, decision making as a collective enterprise. So we're always working with the community members to vote on the different issues that are coming up, um, especially in our programming for the later year, thinking about um, including them in, in how the organization functions and how the organization moves forward and being sure that that piece of that, that cultural piece is so important and relevant, but also making sure right that we're not um, that we're understanding it from each individual perspective. I think another thing that we do is using an organizing model that comes from a, a lot of these um, indigenous backgrounds and ways of organizing. So for form, folks form committees um, that they can vote on um, the governance of that committee um, to highlight different issues that are impacting them and finding ways to solve those issues. So I think that's a really vital piece because they're they themselves are organizing and as community members, as particular people of a particular culture and language um, to work forward and kind of really build out La Red as, as an organization. Now, I'm, in, I'm curious to know what role, uh, well, first you can explain, you know, is there space or, you know, do first generation, maybe children, like, are they a part of this organization as well, whether they're working with some of the families or they're a part of the families? And how do you guys um, just address, you know, their presence there? Because I could imagine for them, it's also uh, this mixed feeling of mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, this is my home and this is where I'm from, but I also have this other culture. And how do you acknowledge that when you are working with those types of families? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think a lot of our families are mixed families where we have um, children that are born here in the U.S. And that is definitely um, an experience that I also share as both of my parents are immigrants from Mexico. Um, so that kind of informs the way I move in the world. Um, but for our members, we do a lot of work around cultural transmission, either of language or practices. We have a collective um, called Voces, which is primarily made up of women that work with their children to pass on their language, their food, um, different aspects of their culture that they find important to them, that they want their children to know being raised here in the US. We also have another group called Arte and Pintura, like art and paint, um, that is with um, women and their children that they can come in and learn arts and crafts that are from their home countries and really share in that practice, which is really working with your hands and being creative in a space that you know is often, especially New York, is moving and really rushed. Um, so that's really um, beautiful to see. And then really bringing in the children when we can. So some of our programming is more geared towards adults, but we also really try to include children to learn about their culture um, and to really um, embrace that and, and feel that and kind of knowing that as well, that they're growing up in New York and that brings different challenges. So really trying to work with the family as a whole to address that when there might be either tension of growing up in a different culture than your parents or um, addressing other barriers that might exist, especially with the education system and the court systems if children find themselves um, having challenges in those spaces. Thank you so much for sharing that because, uh, you know, just having this conversation now, I just thought about it like, you know, I think sometimes we often just think of the adults, um, mm -hmm. which obviously they have so much to do with. So it is important that we focus on them. But I'm like, I wonder how the, the you know, the first generation children um, are also dealing with this and how they navigate that. Mm -hmm. um, as somebody who's also first generation, uh, my dad is from the Caribbean. You know, I, I think about like, oh, yeah, how do you actually stay connected to your mm -hmm. culture? And I think that um, although this work is important uh, when we're talking about anything that's dealing with like legal stuff all that stuff is important but I think like kind of staying true to your culture is mm -hmm. also very important would you say that's part of like you know the mission or like helping these communities advance socially culturally does that help you know uh when you involve the children as well 
I think so. I think it straightens the family unit as a whole, right? When you can see yourself also reflected in um, your children and your parents kind of coming together in that same culture. And it really brings about a, um, a strength and an empowerment, which I think is so vital, especially when we're seeing, you know, across the U.S., um, just racism and discrimination, how if really harnessing a cultural identity can be such a strengthening power. Um, and part of like the resilience of children, the resilience growing up here in the U.S., um, I think that's really important in kind of navigating these systems. And then you're also creating another sort of generation legacy for this work to continue, right? Which is really important is that continual, um, continual work. Now, one of uh, one activity is the annual School for Life, Health, and Justice. Can you tell me a little bit more about the initiative and how it benefits the Indigenous immigrant community? Sure. So that is our annual. Um, school that happens over the summer. Um, so folks at the beginning of the year will vote on different topics that are of interest to them. So this year, for example, we had a workshop on domestic violence. We also had a workshop on um, public benefits. We had a workshop on um, traditional foods. And we're, we'll bring in presenters either that are in Mexico or in other countries via Zoom, or we'll have partnerships with different organizations in the city or kind of bringing out a leader in the community that can speak to that topic and then sharing that information. So one of the things that we really strive for is um, access to information and making sure that that information is accessible in the language that people speak, um, that is coming from people that are trusted um, from the community and, and really making sure that we're um, addressing those barriers to information that often exist. So really trying to find ways to bring that information to the community in our community space that people already feel com comfortable in and familiar in and where they can feel free to ask questions and share. It also usually ends with, um, with food. So folks are always coming in to share, which is where even more questions spring up as of digesting their food and <laughs> thinking about the information that was shared, which is really important. Um, and then it always ends with a certification. Um, so folks get a certificate for participating in the event. Um, and if the children were participants as well it's for certain topics, um, they can also receive that. That's, that sounds amazing. Now, I want to talk about your, your organization's overall goal, where you envision cities that all communities are welcome, included, and represented, regardless of their immigration status. You know, what are some specific challenges that Indigenous immigrant communities face in achieving this vision? And I also want to focus on the fact that, like, what are some of the challenges that they face in New York? Because I, I know that uh, if you're from New York, obviously it's a great city and we're all <laughs> lucky to be here. Uh, but I think people sometimes think that, like, it's kind of a utopia because there's so many different cultures and backgrounds that uh, you may not see the same challenges that we may see in like different parts of the country. Uh, but what is that experience like, especially in New York City? Mm -hmm. So I think um, there's definitely challenges. I think New York City is one, a really welcoming city in a lot of ways, but I think one of the challenges that we've witnessed is that a lot of folks, as I mentioned earlier, don't speak Spanish or don't speak English. So really trying having difficulty navigating the city um, that's really foreign to them and in, in a different language, I think can be a big barrier to, um, to that experience. I think we are also experiencing um, a lot of shifts in different policies that can really impact how people view themselves and communicate with one another. I think one of the challenges that we faced is just a lot of myths about either accessing public benefits or accessing other resources in the city of like, if you, you know, ask for help here, that might impact you in this way or might impact your children in the future. And really trying to dismantle some of those myths that exist and that are um, very easily shared um, online and really trying to bring back in that information that is true information to make sure that people feel comfortable. Um, it also means opening up other avenues where people can feel confident in sharing about themselves and sharing their culture and, and fully embracing that. I think a lot of times um, that can be challenging because of racism and because of discrimination. Folks might try to hide different aspects of themselves as a self-protection, um, but really trying to find spaces where that doesn't have to happen and like our cultural spaces being one of those, um, our location in the Bronx and really trying to be that welcoming environment and trying to find ways to change the policies that are restrictive, that are limiting and really impacting the well-being of our community members. And I know you mentioned that language, uh, language barriers can be a challenge. Is that associated in any way with language justice? Can you tell me a little bit more about what that is um, and how your organization works towards that? Mm -hmm. So for us, we have a, um, a committee of Ecolibri, which is our interpreters collective. We also have Voces that does interpretation work and um, transmission of language. And that for us is having interpreters that can speak indigenous languages in different spaces that folks might be navigating. Um, 
So that could either be in a healthcare setting. Um, we know that a lot of our members might not have either health insurance or a primary care doctor. So what does it mean to have an interpreter available for those visits to really make sure that they're accessing the care that they need? Um, also in education settings, if parents are trying to enroll their children, that can be a big challenge if there isn't someone that speaks their same language. Um, it means being able to use their language and having the forms that are available to them, having um, interviews that might be necessary to access public benefits, be available to them in their language or having interpreters that's available. We know that interpretation is a right, but often that's not in the language that they need. It might be provided in Spanish, um, but that's not adequate for our population that speaks so many different languages from the different countries of origin. And I kind of want to expand on that a little bit more, uh, just talking about health, because it's something that I'd never really thought of Previously, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do how do these language barriers affect so many communities um, in regard to health and well-being? Uh, do they possibly not feel comfortable maybe going to their doctor um, if their doctor doesn't speak the same language, or is there like a disconnect uh, if you have a translator uh, there? Can you just talk about you know what that experience is like in terms of health and well-being? Mm -hmm. I think it can create a, a barrier to either accessing benefit accessing a public, um, sorry, <laughs> to accessing a primary care doctor, or accessing um, health insurance. If you don't have health insurance, it can be really difficult to pay out of pocket for medical expenses. So that's definitely one thing we're seeing. Um, and the enrollment process for health insurance is really confusing. There's also um, income eligibility. There's also immigration eligibility and all of that creates additional um, barriers where folks might not know that they're eligible um, and might remain uninsured. And then with accessing a doctor, um, you can just think about when you enter a doctor's office how many forms you have to fill out and there isn't any assistance to to fill that out that can really be an unwelcoming environment i think a lot of these spaces are doing um what they can but i think it's often really difficult for folks to navigate that if they don't have someone that speaks their same language or can understand how they're expressing even the symptoms that they're feeling right of like the way that someone might feel um a particular pain or um thinking about like trauma and how, how that might be expressed, mental health and physical health and how those are so connected, but folks might have different ways of expressing that. It um, might be difficult for a doctor to understand if there isn't the either adequate um, language or cultural understanding. Now, can you elaborate on the role of indigenous traditions and health practices in the work of your organization, especially in the light of historical experiences of medical violence and the challenges posed by the COVID-19 crisis? Mm -hmm. So the COVID-19 crisis definitely created um, a big challenge for us in terms of misinformation that was being spread about the virus, about what it meant to, to be infected, about vaccines. So there was a lot of effort for community members to become vaccinated and really pushing um, the right information in the languages that, that people speak. So there was a lot of work done to record videos of people talking about COVID-19 in indigenous languages and really sh sharing that to spread um, accurate information. There's also a lot of sharing that happened around um, traditional remedies. So that was either teas that people were drinking or other ways that they felt they were feeling better um, that they wanted to, to share. So that was either happening in our different, different channels that we have. Um, but really bringing about that awareness of like what that could mean for individuals um, not necessarily practicing in sort of Western medicine, but other ways of knowing um, and of feeling um, in their bodies, all right? So that health piece was really important and finding different ways of, um, of addressing the, the pandemic. Now, can you just share any success stories or impactful moments from your work with the organization that highlights the positive changes and progress you've witnessed within ind indigenous immigrant communities in NYC? Okay, it's gonna take me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, I know you, you mentioned that it's pretty new to you. I guess I could frame it as in, you know, what do you hope to see, uh, since this is kind of like a, a new journey for you, what do you hope to see for the future of the work that you're doing here um, in this organization, especially for these communities in New York City? Mm -hmm. I think always with this work, you want it to s still be rooted in the community. So trying to find ways that to continue to empower the community to learn about these processes. I think I can come in and share my, my knowledge information, but it really is important for folks to know how to access these things on their own for themselves, um, how to advocate for themselves. I think that's something that's really important. And we're seeing that every day in our community, but really making sure that we're honoring those um, ways of knowledge and of um, communicating and sort of really trying to find ways to keep pushing that forward and really being able to share my expertise, but also 
continuing to learn from the community members so we can continue to strengthen our organization. And what can people do if they want to get more involved um, and let's say, you know, they are from this community and they're like, you know what, I could be doing so much more for my community. What could they do to simply just start to learn more or even get involved? Always come visit us in the Bronx. Um, so we are very identifiable because we have a brand new mural um, on our street, but we have events that are happening pretty much every day. So we have a music class, we have an embroidery class, different arts classes. And we also have our upcoming New York Land event, which is happening in October. That is our annual celebration where we bring folks together to celebrate in food and in, in um, in artwork and in language. We also bring folks from Mexico or other countries to share in those traditions. So we'll invite folks to come and bring their expertise um, to us and share it with the community. So we're always having um, events for the community. We also do a lot of work around health access so bringing health fairs and health information to the members. Um, so there's always something happening if folks want to get involved. I think it's really um, continuing to grow as folks do learn more about us, which is really exciting and wanted to make sure that people can access that information. Well, thank you so much for joining us and, you know, having this conversation with us. And I also love that it's just, it's not all paperwork. There is some, <laughs> there's some fun stuff. There's a lot of arts and food. So thank you so much for joining us and just kind of sharing a little bit more about your organization. Thank you so much. We've come to the end of our show today. We hope you enjoyed this week's discussion on the Bronx Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forums. To rewatch this week's edition, you can catch the Recable cast right here on bronxnet.org. If you want to join the conversation and present your point of view, you can visit our social media at Bronxnet TV. Join us next week as we continue to elevate the discussion and bring further awareness across the globe. I'm Kim Take care.